Folks, you have your Bible. Turn to the book of Galatians with me tonight. Chapter number one. I hope one of the things that you try to do if you're born again is to memorize the books of the Bible. I learned them at Beaumont Grammar School. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was horrible, wasn't it? Public school system teaching you the books of the Bible. Galatians chapter number 1 and verse number 1. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me to the churches of Galatia, Grace be to you in peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Watch this now. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than that which we preach to you, let him be accursed. As I say before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel to you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Father, I pray you'd bless your word now. In thy holy name, amen. That word accursed is the Greek word anathema, anathema. And you have to get a little historical background to understand what that word means. It literally means given over to a deity, either for good or for bad, for the most part, for bad. In plain words, let him, he or she, be placed into the, into the hands of God. Now, the ancient world is very superstitious, and still is for that matter. And people had what they called votive offerings. How many's ever heard of a votive offering? Few of you have. It had to do with the anatomy of the human body. It had to do with things that you brought to your deity in prayer and ask your deity to either bless that or help you with some area of your life or something of that nature. And so a votive offering was a very prominent thing. The reason we know it is because we have all kinds of archaeological artifacts from that time period everywhere. All you have to do is go to practically any museum and you'll see, you'll see many, 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 many votive offerings. But the point is the Apostle Paul uses a word here that relates to that. It relates to the fact that if this individual is going to refuse to preach the truth, he's going to preach another gospel, let him be given over to God. Let him be given over to God. And um, I've seen that happen in my lifetime. I've seen people struck down, taken from the face of this earth. I've seen people just literally gone. Folks, we're all expendable. God doesn't need a single great man in this world. He doesn't need any of the great fundamental Baptist preachers. He doesn't need any of the greats in the Catholic Church or the Episcopal or, the, or, the, uh, or any of the rest of the nominees. He doesn't need them. We need him. We need him. We need him. So forget your great men, but you've got a great God. And the bigger your God is, the smaller men will become. That's the problem. We get our eyes on men, you are certain for a fall because every man will eventually let you down in one way or another. So the Apostle Paul prepares them here and he said, now listen, he said, you've got a problem in your midst. And he said, these people are changing the gospel. Now we know that's happening today. Some of the prominent uh, men in this country or women in this country have children and their children have entered into the quote unquote ministry and they've begun to pervert and distort the truth that mom or dad had been, had been ministering. And they're perverting it. And they're saying that Christ was not virgin born. They're saying the blood atonement is not necessary for salvation. They're teaching all kinds of heretical things. And it's a shame. But they teach it because it can be received and accepted today. The spirit now has reached the point of saturation. 
It's there. It's everywhere. You can't get away from it. And, uh, and it's, uh, when this happens, a thing that they call a paradigm shift takes place. So what is that? That's when everything just all of a sudden appears overnight to change. And uh, they'll call evil good and good evil. I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but folks, when the word Christian is mentioned on television anymore, they spit it out. It's an offensive term. If you're a Christian in this country, uh, and not, and not here but around the world, and they use that term Christian, it's always, always in a derisive sense. Terrible. Isn't that something? And it, it's almost as if the Christians are the ones burning the country down and blowing up the buildings and, and massacring people and all of that. It's, it's almost as if that the people that are doing this get no blame, but it's all shifted toward the Christian. It shows you that the mindset of people, folks, is completely perverted. Amen. Completely perverted. Their minds are warped. And that's what's happening. So the apostle warned them the first century. And he said, don't let anybody come into your midst and change the gospel. And the gospel, the simple gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, how Christ died for your sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried and then he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Don't let anybody ever alter that. That's the gospel. Well, what about what's added? No, don't add anything to that. Christ died for your sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried. Then he rose from the dead. And amen. And the Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter number 10, If thou shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans, chapter number 10, verse 13, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But you see, this business of a curse is something that runs deep. John chapter number 7, verse 49, here's what the Pharisees and the Jews said about the common man on the street. But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Remember reading that? They said they were cursed because they're not, uh, they're not, uh, they're not the elite and the informed as we are. Deuteronomy chapter number 7, verse 26, Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. But thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. Things can be cursed. I told you the story about the missionary who went into the house and saw this idol that had been carried into this home from this, this woman innocently bought it at some flea market or somewhere, put it on her mantle, and immediately she started having all kinds of problems in her home. And the missionary was visiting with the preacher, and the preacher and the missionary and the missionary looked at that and told the preacher, he said, that's the problem in this house, that idol that's sitting there in that home. Now, an idol in a home of an unsaved man is of the same spirit as that unsaved man. You as a Christian tonight, if you're truly born again, the one that lives within you will clash. Just like that. If you come into the presence of evil. If you come into the presence of demonism, idolatry and all of that, just like that, there will be a clash. You cannot abide with them. You cannot fellowship with them. You cannot walk with them. Have nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. There can be no, can be no uh, commonality or communion with the saints of God and Belial. What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? You can't do it. It will clash just like that. I have walked into homes that the minute I walked into that home, I felt something inside me turn cold and dead. And I said, I'm getting out of this place. And I have been around people, and I felt the same thing from them. So it's not a joke, folks. It's not a game. The spirit world is a powerful place. It is a powerful place. Romans 9, verse 3. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He could wish that, but he could not receive that because he has been blessed. The apostle Paul, of course, is placing himself as an offering for his people. You see what I'm saying? At taking their place. But God would not allow it because the Apostle Paul was a chosen vessel to him and he was full of the Holy Ghost 
And he had a mission and a purpose on this earth. Now, I want you to notice something here. This is very important, the part I'm going to get into right now. Look at chapter 1, verse 18. The Apostle Paul talks about his conversion. And then he says in chapter 1 of Galatians, verse 18, After three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. The Apostle Paul had been saved on the road to Damascus. He went off into Arabia. And then three years later he went into Jerusalem from Antioch of Syria, which is in the north. He traveled to the south and he went to see Peter. Now he went to see Peter because Peter was very prominent. He went to see him. And he stayed with him 15 days. Then Paul turned around and went back to Antioch of Syria. Went back up there to Antioch of Syria. And notice what he says again in chapter number 2 and verse 1. Then 14 years after, I went again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me. So now he's been saved 17 years. 17 years. That's what I take from the text. I don't believe this is 14, day, 14 years from his, from his new birth but 14 years after the three-year period. But anyway, 17 years into his, into his conversion, he goes back and he takes someone with him. He's going back from Antioch of Syria. He goes back and when he gets there, he finds that while he's there that they have three named that are very prominent. He said, Peter, James, and John. He said, of these three, he said, among these people in Jerusalem, these names are very big to them, Peter, James, and John. Now, why would they be? Who was Peter? <laughs> Who was James? Who was John? That's the inner circle. And they're apostles. They're the original 12, see? But the apostle Paul said they added nothing to me. He said, my call and my ministry and my apostleship is not based on anything that goes on in Jerusalem. It is completely separate from that because I had a personal encounter with Christ. Amen. Now watch what happens. And this is the point in this tonight. Watch what happens. Look at chapter number 2 and verse 11. Now Paul has made two trips to Jerusalem. Now on this third encounter with Peter, chapter number 2 and verse 11. But when Peter was come to where? Antioch. So now Peter has left Jerusalem and he has traveled to Antioch. Antioch is in Syria. Antioch is in the north. Jerusalem, of course, is in Israel, the capital of Israel. And it was the birthplace of Christianity. But Antioch was the birthplace of biblical Christianity. Now let that settle in your mind for a moment tonight. Jerusalem was the birthplace of Christianity. For in Acts chapter number 2, when Peter got up and preached on the day of Pentecost, Holy Ghost came down upon them in cloven tongues like as a fire, mighty rushing wind, house was filled, and they spake in tongues, and God anointed them that day, and the church of the living God was born as a spiritual uh, entity. Not that they weren't many saved before that, but here is the birth on, as a spiritual entity took place in Jerusalem. But now, there's a problem in Jerusalem. And what is that? It is overwhelmingly Jewish. Jerusalem is overwhelmingly Jewish. So it's going to have an enormous Jewish influence in Christian doctrine as it begins to develop in Jerusalem. Not so with Antioch. Antioch of Syria is Gentile. And Antioch of Syria is the birthplace of biblical Christianity. It was there that the real doctrines of the New Testament were fortified, established, preached, stood for, and disseminated throughout the world. So when Peter comes up from Jerusalem, having been corrupted to a degree by Judaizers who are trying to add some Jewish element to the Christian faith, the apostle Paul immediately confronts him. And where does he do it? He does it in Antioch of Syria. And of course, you know what happened. Peter got right. You say, well, now, was it a big deal? It was a huge deal. Because if we had not had Antioch of Syria, and we had not had the apostle Paul, and we had been left with Peter and his vacillation with the Jews, 
and saying that you must be circumcised to be saved and that you've got to divorce yourself from all Gentiles and all of this Judaizing that's coming in. And they're going to add the Sabbath day and pork abstaining and all this other stuff and just keep piling it on and piling it on. What kind of Christianity do you think you'd have today? See, it was the Apostle Paul who laid out the groundwork and developed it and built upon it, and that's why we've got what we have. Now, here's what's another thing that's important about Antioch of Syria. Now, there's an Antioch of Pisidia, an Antioch of Pisidia, and don't get them mixed up. This is Antioch of Syria. This is Syria. This is the Syria that's still over there. This is the Damascus that has the street called Straight still over there. This is where the Aleppo, that where, they're, where they're killing all these people. This is where Mosul, where this ancient Christian uh, 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 family lives, has been there for 2,000 years in Syria. It was out of Syria that Ignatius, who was the bishop of Syria, or uh, bishop of Antioch, Ignatius, this was one of the early, early, early church fathers within the first century after Christ within the first hundred years. Now here's the way the transmission goes. You've got the Apostle John, who was the last of all the apostles. He outlived them all. The Apostle John was exiled. The Apostle John eventually passed away. But he had a personal disciple, and his name was Polycarp. Polycarp was the personal disciple of the Apostle John. Ignatius was a personal friend to Polycarp. Now you're looking at a small circle, aren't you? You're looking at people who knew the apostles. You're looking at people who knew one of the 12 folks. Now you don't get any further back than that. We're talking about the first century, 100, 110 AD. Ignatius is the bishop of Antioch. Polycarp is the bishop of Smyrna. Smyrna is in Turkey right now. This is modern Turkey. It was called it's called Ishmir now, but at, at that time it was uh, Smyrna. If you'll remember in the book of Revelation, one of the seven churches of Asia Minor was the church of what? Smyrna. Smyrna, exactly. I had the great privilege to go to Smyrna. I went into the very church that the man said that Polycarp pastored there in Smyrna. You talk about a blessing. I mean, you talk about privileged. I thought to myself, my, my. This is one of the original martyrs of the church of God. And he pastored this church. And there's still a church there in, a, in an absolutely predominantly Muslim country because Turkey is Muslim. And, uh, but there's a few here and there, places where, where, there, where there's some a Christian witness. So Ignatius of Antioch and Polycarp of Smyrna were good friends. And they communicated with each other and visited with each other and talked with each other. And Polycarp was a disciple, a direct disciple of the Apostle John. Ignatius died a martyr's death. Where did he come from? He came from Antioch. Why? Did, why? Because Antioch was the, was, the, was the foundation, the hotbed of biblical Christianity. Where were the disciples first called Christians? Antioch. Antioch. That's what it says in the book of Acts. See how it goes together? See how this fits? They were called Christians in Antioch because they were Christ-like. That's what the word Christian means. It means like Christ. And uh, it was a good word until this last generation showed up. <laughs> it's not anymore. But I'm going to tell you something right now till the day I die. I'm a Christian. You better believe it. The last breath in my body. I'm a Christian. I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I am not ashamed. <laughs> not ashamed. But anyway, Ignatius, they threatened him and said, we're, we're, going to, we're going to take you, and we're going to take you to the arena in Rome, and we're going to feed you to the beast. You know what the old man said? The old man said, that's good with me. I want to be bred in the teeth of these beasts. That's good with me. If that's the will of God, then let me go like that. That's what Ignatius said. Polycarp was 86 years old. And they took Polycarp and made a martyr out of him. The Roman soldiers came to get Polycarp. Of course, Rome, of course, you know, Rome rendered to Caesar that which is Caesar's. Every generation has to understand who Caesar is and understand Caesar's authority, Caesar's power. You understand that? You understand what I'm saying? 
You have to understand who Caesar is. Render to Caesar that which is Caesar's and to God that which is God's. So they came, to, they came for Polycarp and the Roman soldiers uh, had gathered around this old man, 86 years old. And he said, he said, men, let me feed you. Before you take me, let me give you something to eat. And they said, okay. So he prepared a meal for them. And they had a good meal. Then he said, would you please let me pray at least for one hour before you take me? They said, that's fine. So that old man stood for two hours, lifted his head toward heaven. And as he always had, he prayed for two solid hours. And they took him. But the Roman soldiers said before they took him, they said, you don't need to be going with us. We, we, don't, know, we don't know anybody that's as decent and clean and as a good a man as you are. But we have no choice. We have to obey our orders. And so they took him away. They took Polycarp off. And they finally got him to the place of execution. And they took him to the stake. They were going to burn him at the stake and burn him alive. It's a horrible death, isn't it? Horrible. Horrible death. Isn't it amazing how men can be, how, 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 uh, how, un how unbelievably violent, wicked men can be toward men? But they took him and tied him to the stake. And he said, the man that came up and stood in his face and said, now, listen. You don't have to die like this. All you've got to do is just say, I renounce Jesus. I just, I just, I just, just renounce him and we'll let you go. All these people know you. They've, they've watched you for years. And so if you'll say that, then you can spare your life. He looked at him and he said, 86 years I've served him. 86 years he's treated me well. He's never done me wrong. And I'm not going to deny him now. And so they piled the wood up and they burned the old man to death. Now the story goes how that while he was tied to the stake, that the flames came up and kind of formed a semicircle around his body and that they could see him inside the flames and they weren't touching him. And apparently the Almighty had intervened for his servant while he was tied to that stake. And it enraged them that they could not do to this old man what they wanted to do to him. So one of them took a spear and shoved it into him. And, uh, and apparently he died from the spear, and then they took his body and burned it. But he was already dead, so he didn't really burn alive. It was kind of like the Lord, you know, when they took that spear and shoved it into his side, and the Bible said forthwith came blood and water. He sealed his testimony by his faith in Christ. That was Polycarp. That was one of our brothers. That was Ignatius. That's another one of our brothers. We're going to get to meet our brothers one day. We're going to get, we're going to get, to, we're going to, get to meet our brothers and our sisters that died in the arena in Rome to satisfy the bloodlust of the Romans and all over the world that have died the martyr's death. In the book of Revelation, it talks about their souls being under the altar. The indication is they were probably beheaded they may bring the guillotine back in the tribulation period and they may start chopping the heads off of, of, uh, of the believers in Christ, the Christians. Now, when I say I use that term guardedly because it won't be the church in the tribulation. Church is gone. But even though there will still be Christians that are saved in the tribulation because there's only one Savior. They're called tribulation saints. But they'll, they'll, they'll die the martyr's death. But before we leave this world, some of us may too. We don't know how bad it's going to get. And uh, this world is not, uh, is, is not being converted. Who knows? I don't know what's going to happen. God may do something. He may work a wonderful miracle. But I do know this. I'm going to meet Polycarp, and I, I'd like to see him. And I'm going to meet Ignatius, too. I'd like to see him. I'd like to meet these men. Marcy and the heretic. You ever heard of him? Marcy and the heretic, had, uh, he took a Bible, and he cut whole sections of the book out. Just took parts of it, especially the New Testament. He didn't like the New Testament. He took whole parts of the New Testament books and just took them, just cut them out. They're still doing that today, you know. Right, he's called Marcion. He's called Marcion the heretic. Well, one day, he uh, he came in contact with uh, Polycarp, and uh, he said, "Polycarp, so you know who I am?" Polycarp says, "I know who you are." Marcion says, "Well, who am I?" He said, "You're the firstborn of Satan." <laughs> That's who you are. That's who you are. 
Yes, sir. You see, Marcion was a Gnostic. We still got Gnostics. We got plenty of them around today. And uh, you can see where their influence is being fought throughout the Bible. Well, you've got, you've got the Apostle John. Then you've got Polycarp, his disciple. Then you have uh, uh, Irenaeus. And Irenaeus was the disciple of Polycarp. And Irenaeus wrote a, a scathing rebuke of these Gnostics and this stuff in the first century, and he called it against heresies. Now, I guess this was the first, really the first product to come out, to produce, to combat, to come against all this Gnostic heresy that was being taught and preached in the first century, first, second, third century after Christ. If you ever get an opportunity, look up Irenaeus against heresies and read some of the material that's in there. And then you'll begin to understand what these people were up against in the first century after Christ. It's never been an easy road. From day one, they tried to corrupt the scriptures. From day one, they tried to corrupt the gospel of Christ. Now think about this. Here we are 2,000 years later. 2,000 years later. How many of you have heard men of God all your lifetime open up a Bible, rear right back and preach God's word and preach the truth of the gospel to you? That didn't come cheaply. You know why you got the gospel now? God preserved his word. Amen. He saw to it that you'd get it. That's the point. That's why you have it. Because you know the gospel. Everybody in this house knows the gospel. He had a reason for that. Because he's going to come and get his bride. And he's going to present himself a bride without spot or wrinkle. Or any such thing. He's the only groom that grooms his bride. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. But he does. He grooms his bride. He said, this is exactly the way I want you, right here. Now you're ready to go with me. That's the way it works. And that's what he's doing. And he will have a bride. And it'll be the bride of Christ. And he's going to come and get us. And I wish he'd come tonight and get us. I'd be very happy about the matter. Amen. I'd be happy if I never saw that house I live in again, walked out that back door again, if I heard a shout standing up here tonight, that'd be the most blessed thing I could possibly hear. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen, amen. So, we know the story of Antioch. Remember, Antioch is the birthplace of biblical Christianity. And Jerusalem is the birthplace of Christianity. Now, I want you to look at Galatians chapter number 3 and verse 1. And this will be the last thing we cover tonight. But Galatians 3 and verse 1, the apostle Paul said, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Notice the term he uses there. Boskainao. Uh, Boskaino. Boskaino. Foolish have been bewitched. Foolish Galatians, you've been, you've been, had a spell cast upon you. That word is associated with an evil eye. How many's ever heard of an evil eye? You read anything into the occult world and the ancient world and you'll get the evil eye. It will pop up, believe me. I remember when I was a kid, I used to hear that all the time. It was part of the, of the, of the speech of the folks. Yeah, she gave me the evil eye. I mean, women never heard somebody say that. Oh, yeah, better believe it. Well, it doesn't really mean today to people what it used to mean. It used to mean the casting of a spell looking into the soul and projecting an evil force and power against someone. So the apostle says, here you are. You've separated yourself from the gospel of Christ. You're preaching another gospel. You're buying into Judaism, a, Judaist, a Judaistic type, Judaizers uh, type of gospel. And somebody has bewitched you. They've cast a spell upon you. Now, you know something? That's, that's, a, that's a real, that's a reality. You can go to some churches, folks, and if you're not careful, you're going to get bewitched when you walk in that place and before you get out the door. You've got to be careful. You've got to discern the spirit. If you walk into a house that's called a house of God and somebody gets up there in that pulpit, folks, and they begin to deny the virgin birth and the blood covenant, the blood atonement, and the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, just ease yourself out that back door. And dust your garments as you go out. Because you just walked out of a hell hole. 
It may have a cross on it. It may have stained glass in the windows. But the only purpose in our existence is to exalt the true Christ. And if we denigrate his blessed name and drag him down to our level and put him with the rest of the occult world, then we have, we have no purpose in existence. And so he said, who's bewitched you? And they had bewitched him because they allowed, they allowed Judaizers to come in there and pervert the gospel. Now notice, folks, <clears throat> how long ago was this? This was 2,000 years ago. This was in the lifetime of the Apostle Paul. This was before 100 A.D. Now, you can get into the chronology of the New Testament. And the chronology of the New Testament goes kind of like this. The first book written, written in the New Testament was more than likely 1 Thessalonians. Who wrote that? Exactly. Paul wrote it. There are those who say that Galatians fits very close. So what's that mean? That means right off the bat. That means without any, you know, any time span here, we've got, we've got people bewitching these people, casting spells upon them. And, 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 and it came from two sources, two main sources. It came either from the Judaizers, which tried to drag them back under Judaism, tried to bring elements of Judaism and corrupt the simple, straight gospel of Christ, or it came from Gnosticism, which was, which was North Africa and uh, Philo and that crowd. It came from there. It came from Gnosticism. And Gnosticism, of course, goes all the way back to Brahma, Buddha, Hinduism, goes all the way back to the to birthplace of the occult world, the occult religion. That's where Gnosticism came from. And of course, if you want to go trace it all the way back, trace it all the way back to Genesis chapter number 6, when these sons of God came to the daughters of men, and they carried with them a, perverse, a, a perversion of the truth. That's where Gnosticism came from. So the early New Testament writers that wrote these books, they had to deal on one hand either with Judaizers or on the other hand with Gnostics. And so they had to deal with this. And what you've got here, you've got a, lot of, you've got a, you've got a mixture of both. And the Apostle Paul tells them, don't let someone uh, uh, put, cast a spell over you. Because when that happens, then it's going to cost you and it's going to cost your children. The only faith that these kids really know right now, folks, is your faith. The faith of the parents. That's all they know. I guarantee you right now. If these kids, any of these kids are in a public school system, they see very little of the Christian faith in there. Oh, they may have some friends that are Christians. Good for that. But they'd be very little. They're, they're, they're more and more in the minority. It's just not the same. Everything's changed. And uh, this is one of the things that tells me that Christ is coming back soon. Because the church isn't converting the world. The world's converting, converting the church. In chapter number 3 and verse number 6, the apostle said, even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, though therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. Now, he tells you that if you're a Christian, Paul's telling these Galatian believers, if you're a Christian, your faith is just like Abraham's faith. Just like him. Although Abraham lived 1,900 years before Christ, Abraham simply believed God. You remember the message I brought you just a few weeks ago about how God cannot lie. That he has exalted his word above his name. And buddy, his name is high up there. <laughs> For the Bible said God hath given Christ a name that is above every name. That at that name every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. So to believe God is the highest honor you can pay God. You understand that? Don't give him lip service and say, I love you, Lord, and you're the greatest and this and that and blah, 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 and continue on and you don't believe his word because you don't live by it. Faith is not theoretical. Faith is not an abstract thing. Faith is a reality that guides your life. Why call you me Lord, Lord, he said. And do not the things which I say. Right? The Apostle John said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. In him. And what are the three things that he mentioned? Somebody tell me tonight. 
That's exactly right. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That pretty well covers the whole spectrum as it, does, as it leads to the world. Now, your, your obligation to serve the Lord and live for Him in 2017 is going to be a little bit different than, it, than someone who lived in 1817. Why? Because you have different avenues of, 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 uh, of temptation and you have different things you have to deal with today than they did then. You see what I mean? But the basic principle is the same. The principle is the same. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So the scripture is very careful here to tell us that Abraham simply believed God. And what does it say about that, about his righteousness? It was accounted. All right. God imputed righteousness to Abraham. What's that mean? That means that he has a ledger, he puts Abraham's name on it, and right next to it, God put down righteous. That's what he did. He put down righteous. Now, righteous in its basic meaning means right standing with God. So Abraham believed God, and Abraham's belief in God, his simple faith, like our faith, but the Bible says he counted it to him for righteousness. Now, it changes in the New Testament. And this is what you need to see tonight. Galatians chapter number 3, verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same, of the same are the children of Abraham. Now, watch this. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel to Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. How many of you caught that? Did you catch that thing about the scripture foreseeing? How'd that happen? I thought the scripture was just black ink on white paper. I'm wrong, huh? There's more to it than that, right? It's the word of God that's alive, right? The word of God is quick and powerful. You know what you just read here? Go back and read it again. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, that's me, through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying, you got the scripture doing two things right here. You've got the scripture actively involved in what's going to take place in the future. It can see into the future. And you've got the scripture preaching. In other words, the message that it sees in the future, it preaches related to what it sees in the future. Now, how in the world could something printed on a book do something like that if it wasn't alive? See? Now, I want you to look in the Bible to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. I need wisdom. Well, then take hold of Christ. I need righteousness. Then take hold of Christ. I need sanctification. Take hold of Christ. I need to be redeemed. Who do I take hold of? See? Now, I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19. Second Corinthians five nineteen, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing, not reckoning, their trespasses against them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, when now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us. He's been made righteousness. He's been made wisdom. He's been made redemption. Now he's made sin for you, for us, who knew no sin. Now watch this. That we might be made the righteousness of God. How? In him. 
So it's no longer my name goes on the board and God says, God imputes or reckons righteousness to me. No longer. My name's not on the board. The only name out there that matters is the name of the Lord Jesus. And I'm in him. And everything God does to him, he does to me. Everything God does for him, he does for me. Every place Christ can go, I can go. All the life that Christ has is my life, for my life is hid with Christ in God. You see what I mean? The Lord Jesus Christ becomes, therefore, the Savior of all mankind for those that would believe on him and receive him. He doesn't need to impute righteousness to you because you're not out there. You're in him. <laughs> And he is righteous. And I'll close with this tonight. The Old Testament righteousness was the right standing of the individual with God as he lived before the Lord, as he walked before the Lord. And the just shall live by his faith, it says. And they did. But the righteousness that we're talking about tonight was a righteousness that did not exist in the Old Testament. Did not exist. It is the righteousness of a sinless, perfect man 2,000 years ago who lived a sinless, perfect life. And there's only one that ever did that. Amen. That righteousness, therefore, was born in Bethlehem of Judea and it, was, and it was brought to full fruition at the cross at Calvary. And God testified of that more than once when he said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so when he arose from the dead and declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead, and the Bible says we are born, we are born by the resurrection from the dead, by his resurrection, that the Lord Jesus Christ ascended to the right hand of the Father, and the only way that he could ascend to the Father was by a righteousness, and the righteousness he ascended by was by his righteousness. And so he ascended to the right hand of the Father by his own righteousness, and that got me in. That got me in. Tonight now, I'm not only saved, hallelujah to God, I'm saved, but I'm kept and I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit till the day of redemption. And everything that I am or ever hope to be is all tied up completely in one man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man. Christianity is the biggest joke in the world when it tries to have all this religious garbage going on without Christ smack in the middle of it. The Lord Jesus is what it's all about, folks. It's all about him. Amen not about me. Father, I pray you bless your word tonight. I pray, Heavenly Father, for those that I've talked to, Lord, recently, God, you know who they are and you know what needs to be done. I pray for them, Father. God, you're the only one that can turn the light on. You turned the light on in my life. My Father, there was a day, Lord, when I was blind and lost, but God, you came to me and you turned the light on. And I'll be forever thankful to you for that, and I'll bless your holy name. And Father, we pray for those who heard the word tonight. It will not return void. It will accomplish that which you please, and it will prosper in the thing whereto you've sent it. In thy holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.